Good morning. My name is Jim Brandt, and it is my privilege to share God's Word with you today. The theme for our chapel devotions this week has been Christ Reveals Himself in the Call to Serve Him. Today we consider how Jesus accomplishes mighty things through unworthy people. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who comes to mind when you think about a person being unworthy? For Green Bay Packer fans, players like Brandon Bostick and Kevin King might come to mind. Both players committed huge errors that led their team to lose an NFC championship and a trip to the Super Bowl. According to Bleacher Report, another Packer legend, Paul Horning, is really not worthy to be a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Now, I can't say whether their list of reasons is correct, but I do know that Horning's coach, Vince Lombardi, knew how to use his talents because their teams won four NFL championships with Horning setting an NFL scoring record that lasted 46 years. If the people in the Bible represent God's Hall of Fame, you wouldn't have to look much further than Jonah to find someone unworthy of that distinction. The only thing most people remember about Jonah is that he was swallowed by a whale. Pretty humiliating. But if we look at what got him into that predicament, we'd find even more significant reasons for Jonah to be considered unworthy. Jonah was called by God to warn the people of Nineveh that their city would soon be overthrown. Nineveh was the greatest city in the world's first real superpower, the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh was to Assyria as New York is to the United States of America. The Assyrians, known for torture and brutality, were ruthless warriors who had been oppressing Israel for many years. If the events that took place recently in Washington, D.C. on January 6th took place in the empire of Assyria, The leaders of that rebellion would have been impaled on poles or flayed, that is, skinned alive, and their dead bodies and hides would have hung in the city as a warning against any future rebellion. Nineveh was located along the banks of the Tigris River, where the modern-day city of Mosul in northern Iraq now stands. Mosul was a stronghold of the Islamic State, ISIS, known as terrorists for videotaping beheadings and for bombing religious and cultural sites, like Jonah's tomb, which is pictured here in ruins. Mosul is the site of some of the world's most horrific and bloodiest military battles in recent memory. Being sent by God to Nineveh would be like being asked by Pastor Hebner to go on a mission trip to share the gospel with ISIS in Mosul. How would you respond? Jonah went the other way. He ran away from God. He booked passage on a ship to the edge of the then-known world, the city of Tarshish, on the southern coast of what is now Spain. There's a long list of ways that Jonah was unworthy, but it's really quite simple. It comes down to this. Jonah was a sinful man called to a divine purpose. Our text finds Jonah soaking wet after being spit out by the fish on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. We read from the third chapter of Jonah. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it a message that I give you. 
Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from greatest to least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. I want you to notice that there is actually very little about Jonah in these passages. We're simply told that he obeyed God. And we only have eight words from his message. We aren't told how the Ninevites were inspired when Jonah told him his amazing fish story. And we don't even hear that they believed Jonah. Instead, the Bible tells us that they believed God. They repented of their sins, and when God saw what they did, he had mercy on them. God accomplished an amazing miracle using a sinful human's act of obedience to save a city with an estimated population of 120,000 people. At the beginning of this message, I asked who comes to mind when you think about a person being unworthy. For many of us listening to this message, our thoughts immediately turn to ourselves. Our conscience is always reminding us of our sins. And Satan constantly uses this to scream accusations at us. Why? One of Satan's chief goals is to immobilize you in response to God's calling. And if he can't get stop you by getting you to see yourself as unworthy he's working overtime to make you see the people around you that way in either case he wants you to take your eyes off christ and what christ has done for you and to focus on your own efforts in chapter four we see that jonah didn't run away because he was timid he wasn't afraid He didn't doubt that God would use his witness to bring the people of Nineveh to repentance. In fact, he was confident that God would convert their hearts and that he would be merciful to them. He just didn't think they deserved it. And in so doing, Jonah repeatedly lost sight of his own need for God's grace. This week, we've been talking about how Christ reveals himself in our calling. When you hear that word calling, you might think these lessons only apply to those people who want to go to Martin Luther College to become a pastor or a teacher. Truth is, God calls each and every one of us to serve him in our relationship with others every day. God calls you when your conscience tells you that you shouldn't give in to peer pressure and be part of something that you know is wrong. He calls you when you see friends falling into sin, and you have the opportunity to warn them of the consequences of that sin. He calls you when a friend who has hurt you deeply is sorry and repents and you are struggling mightily whether you can ever forgive them. And God is calling you when your own sins are heavy on your heart and Satan wants to convince you that you're just not worthy enough to have God's love in your life. In these moments, I pray that you will see how God is seeking to reveal Christ in your calling. My dear friends, take to heart the words of Jonah, an unworthy servant through whom God accomplished mighty things. For Christ truly is a gracious and compassionate God,
slow to anger and abounding in love. God grant each of us the grace to believe and to proclaim this message through Jesus. Amen. We will sing together our closing prayer today by joining in verses 1 to 3 of hymn 542, Dear Lord, to your true servants give. Please remain seated after the hymn for the, this week's final episode of WLTV. We have finally made it to the end of festival week and as of this recording I have no idea how it's going but let's assume it's been great. It's Spirit Day and not to be confused with All Saints Day where the spirits of the saints come back to bless you. After all we're Lutheran. That's right! Today's your chance to get as excited about school spirit as Sam Hartman does when a new flavor of Coca-Cola drops. And now if you'll excuse us we have to get to the Paris Peace Treaty of WLHS already in progress. Well, folks, sure is a treaty. Wow, this really is Paris. Yes, we are here with musicals representatives, Miss Grass and athletics representative, Miss Goodman. Now, you both heard Mr. Lyre's announcement yesterday concerning the conflict? Yeah. Yep. All right, great. So, first things first, apologies. Repeat after me. I, insert name here. I, Sam I, Grass. Goodman. Apologize for starting a Cold War. Apologize for starting a cold war. Over a difference in money. Over a difference in money. Caused by a coach accidentally using the school's credit card at Pick and Save. Caused by a coach accidentally using the school's credit card at Pick and Save. Alrighty, then, if you could just sign here, here, and here. And don't forget the three digits on the back and the date. Perfect. Great. Now that that's official, I would like to take some time to talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Kids, what we have witnessed here in this segment was admittedly an over-romanticized view of how things go on at this school. In reality, half the people in band are in choir, and half the people in sports are in musical stuff. So obviously the idea of there being some sort of musical versus athletic showdown is farther out there than freshmen finding the pool on the third floor. But, as with most fiction, we can still grab a solid lesson from it. That's right, kids, we're going to be talking about unity today. Specifically, where it comes from, the importance of realizing it, and how we can use it. For this, I would like to draw our attention to Romans 7, verse 4. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to one another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear the fruit for God. Now, not only is this passage extremely metal, but also it perfectly shows the kind of fellowship that we have right now. The fellowship that we might be too quick to forget, just like the organizations in the uh, squabble singing on WLTV. So, normally, as sinful human beings, would, we would be subject to the to the law and eternal damnation that goes along with breaking it. However, due to, the Lord, due to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have died to the law, which is to say our method of salvation has changed. Change from being literally impossible and works-based to being 
and, and oh, and law base, which is you know the die to the law thing, uh, to a stupidly easy don't deny it and you get it method, which just counts on your faith and whatnot. So where am I going with this? Well, one of the benefits of having all being collectively saved from eternally traumatic experience, such as the hell this earth can be without Jesus and the literal hell that actual hell is, is the sick fellowship it brings. As the passage states, this sort of universal, unifying, non-discriminatory salvation comes to be in this way so that you might belong to one another. In other words, so that we might, united in a common spiritual past, come to realize and treasure the camaraderie, utility, community, and culture we have right now in all those in, for instance, this building. But let's not stop there. Being united, as we've talked about in many a chapel, is more than just getting along with the underclassmen. It's realizing now that you can accomplish with more with two hands, two minds, or two hearts. As the passage states, in order that we might bear fruit for God. One of the hardest things for the human condition to deal with is another human, and all th humans recognize this. So, if through our common faith we can unite in relative symbiosis to achieve wondrous things, we can really create one heck of a light that will shine really bright. In fact, I would bet even bright enough to obliterate the thick bushel, if you might say, that is 2021. Wow. Thank you, Peter, that, for that uh, wonderful devotion that you definitely didn't write 1 a.m. this morning. Yes. And on that sentimental bombshell, everyone, it is time for this WLTV series to come to an end. Thank you for your attention this week. And you are dismissed. Have a great festival week, everybody.